Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we have another webinar organized by Princeton University's uh, Spendheim Center for Finance. We're very happy to have Richard Zeckhauser with us today. Hi, Richard. Good morning. Good afternoon. Richard will talk about climate policy moving beyond ostriches and polyanas. And I think it probably is one of the most interesting titles for uh, a webinar we had so far. And as usual, I will give some introductory remarks and then Richard will take over and uh, give his presentation. We welcome, of course, the questions in the Q&A box and in the chat box, please uh, ask questions. Now, today, I would like to go back again. What did you do last Monday? Aminio Fraga was talking about Brazil, Brazil's perfect storm. We wanted to get an idea of what's going on in Brazil. And he gave us a long perspective about the Brazilian economy, what happened in the last decades, and why it is so bad, the current situation in Brazil. Today, Richard will talk about climate policy. We had an earlier talk, uh, which is related. Larry Summers was talking about many, many aspects, among them, um, you know, geopolitical aspects and also climate policy touches upon at that as well. Next week, we will have Raghu Rajam. He will talk about emerging market and developing economies. Um, so we will see more about this next week. So before I start, I would like to uh, get into some climate policy and more from a finance angle in the beginning. And then I will actually go in more detail uh, from that. So whenever you think about, should we do much about climate policy? It's a cost benefit analysis. And what's very important in climate change or in climate change policy is to look at the dynamic problem because you have the abatement costs are coming on now, but the benefits of not having a climate catastrophe comes much later. So it's very, very important to have the dynamic uh, setting in mind, some where the time dimension makes a big difference. And you can actually implement any abatement now, and you have the abatement cost that's below the zero line, so these are costs, that's why they're below. And then the future benefits occur later. You can implement it now at this cost. But of course, you can also ramp it up. So Bill Nordhaus actually was propo proposing to ramp up. So he starts small and then ramp up the abatement uh, and then reduce the emissions uh, at an increasing speed. And then you get the benefits. And the question is, how should you do it? Should you start, start slowly and then uh, crank it up and or front load everything or back load, more back loaded? And the question to answer this, that's what we'd like to address. Uh, I would like to address in my opening remarks before Richard is taking over. And one key driver for this is, of course, the discount rate. So the discount rate, how we discount the future compared to the current, present, uh, that's the key here. And the Stern review, which came out, I think now more than 10 years ago, was actually changing the discount rate to a lower level. And that made a huge difference and huge impl implications to what extent we should already act uh, now on to how aggressively we should start now relative to later. Now, to understand the discount rate, I would like to differentiate between different components to which goes into the discount rate. And here I make a very simple example, just having people with a log utility. So the risk aversion coefficient gamma is one and the intertemporal elasticity of substitution, how you want, you want to smooth across time is one. And I also think that all growth rate are normally distributed. So that makes everything very simple and we can express the discount rate in explicit terms very cleanly. So what is the discount rate R? It consists of, um, of rho, which is a time reference rate. How much do you prefer utility uh, in the future relative today? That's your time reference rate, rho. That's the first component. Then there's a second component, which is the expected consumption growth rate. So how much does the economy grow? Or how much will the consumption grow in the economy more generally? So if you're much wealthier, you can consume much more in the future. It would actually be less costly to do it in the future rather than now. So if the consumption growth rate is very high, so the expected consumption growth rate is very high, but then the discount rate should be higher too. What does it mean a higher discount rate means you know, the future costs will be less valued, so you should actually push the costs into the future. Now, the third term is about the volatility or the variance of the consumption growth rate. If the consumption growth rate is very volatile, if there's a high variance, then actually the discount rate is lower. So it's minus the variance of this consumption growth rate. That comes from precautionary savings motive. If there's a lot of uncertainty about the future economy and all this, people would like to save more. 
hence the interest rate is going down so you have a lower uh, discount rate that's that's essentially what's going on there. So in the first three terms together, that's essentially the risk-free rate we are facing, that, that characterizes the risk-free rate in the economy. And that's what goes into the discount rate as a main component, the risk-free rate. But of course, there's also a risk premium on it because it, investing in some new technologies, which or whatever it is, to get the get the benefits of no climate catastrophe down the road is a risky undertaking. So there's a risk premium on it as well. So that the risk premium, what's interesting, the risk premium is of course negative in this setting because you buy essentially insurance. If you invest more, you get actually less downside risk down the road. So this typically is different from traditional finance. The risk premium here is negative. So if there is some covariance between the consumption growth rate and the benefits from having invested in the better technology, that's a negative covariance. So that brings actually the risk free rate or the not the risk rate, it brings the risk premium down, makes it more negative. That brings the discount rate down as well. So all of these elements that characterize it, what the discount rate is. And if you have a low discount rate, that means you value the future a lot. That means that you should undertake very aggressively. Now you should not postpone it uh, to the future much. So the first question is, how does the COVID crisis affect the different components of the discount rate? So one might think so COVID might actually lower the growth rate in the economy. That's a negative shock. So that lowers the discount rates. Expected growth rate is lower. It might also make the future prospects more volatile. That also lowers uh, the discount rate. How it will affect the covariance between consumption growth rate and its benefits from having uh, a more stable environment, that's not clear. But essentially, there are two forces at least which actually lower the discount rate, which means the future counts more compared to the present. Uh, and that means to a steeper ramp. So you want to actually front load your activity uh, now rather than uh, postponing it further. That's the first connection between climate change and COVID, uh, I would say. Now, the next thing, so I jumped here. I would like to do is uh, to say, of course, this was under the assumption that everything is normally distributed, all growth rates are normally distributed. We have seen by the research by Marty Weizmann and others that, you know, there's a lot of tail risk going on. And if there's tail risk, then the, co the risk premium is even more pronounced. One thing I would like to emphasize here is the theory of tipping points. So my wife and I have thought about this a long time ago. We never got around to write it up, and non-linearities. So for example, if uh, the heating goes beyond a certain level, the Gulf Stream might uh, stop, and hence Europe might be in a much colder climate. So if we have an, a tipping point, we know about this tipping point, that also means that the discount rate will be much lower. And if you uh, have an unknown tipping point, you know there is a tipping point, but you don't know when it kicks in, then actually you want to avoid any buildup of stock of CO2, which actually might even trip the worst realization of the tipping point. So you might be even more cautious about this as well. Now, that's all about the, the uh, discount rate. I would like to emphasize another component, which you know I talked a lot with uh, Jean-Pierre Landau about, uh, is uh, COVID and climate policy. If you invest in something and you have a clear path how the investment occurs, then you can also replace existing equipment, existing machines, and also physical capital. You know how to replace them. And if you have in certain industries, you might have very long lasting equipment. So it might take a long time to come with new equipment, but if there's a clear path forward, you can start replacing them now. In other industries, the equipment might depreciate very fast, so you can actually uh, replace them much faster. So it's very important to take the depreciation rate of the equipment into account, which flattens the ramp. That's a force in the other direction, and it might be different from industry to other industries. Then I would like to emphasize, you know, we have to invest in new technologies, in new inventions. And the COVID crisis leads to a lot of rethinking and restructuring across industries. So we are going through a restructuring phase anyway. And to many extent, we have to synchronize uh, the effort across various industries. And if you go to restructuring and rethinking anyway, there might be 
a time now, an opportunity now to start now and do the synchronized effort or the coordinated effort now, because often you have a chicken and egg problem. One industry is doing this, but it's only useful if the other industry is doing this as well, or the customers are doing it as well. And you know, nobody is moving, there's a huge coordination problem. And the COVID crisis might be a synchronization or coordination device for us to jump in now and get this whole thing started perhaps combined with a green deal with uh, government subsidies and so forth. But the key is always to start now and give a clear planning certainty going forward. That's essentially what we're emphasizing, to have this clear planning certainty. But how to incentivize this? Having this clear planning uh, makes useful, but more generally, there's two approaches. I would call them the Malthusian approach. Essentially said we have to cut back on consumption. Everybody has to consume less. If, even in developing economies, they can't have heating or air conditioning because it's too uh, detrimental. We just have to cut it back down. Or we go for an innovative approach. We go for innovation, new technologies. Uh, Ralph Fuchs talked a lot about that. That's essentially, uh, in my view, the, the way to go. But in general, we would like to have some planning certainty, which makes the whole thing less costly. And you can have a clear part of a carbon tax. So that's the message, a clear part of a carbon tax. That gives you a clear CO2 a price certainty. And that's, you know, gives you more planning certainty. You can also go for pollution permits. And pollution permits don't give you a clear CO2 price certainty. They give you more the total pollution in the country or in, at the global scale is certain. So depending where the permits are, are located. And then the question is, you know, what certainty do you prefer more? From an environmental perspective, it's probably more the pollution certainty. From an economic perspective, the, the tax, the price certainty carries a lot. But you can actually manage that. You can manage that if you give the pollution permits for short horizons and then you auction new pollution permits off every three years or every four years, or every one year, and you can fine tune the volume of permits you auction off at these horizons. If, of course, if you auction off pollution permits for the next 30 years, you can't re-optimize really that. In that case, you could have what uh, Jacques de Bla proposed, uh, a central bank approach, where in case there is a central bank type of environmental institution which is active in the permits market and is buying out or issuing more uh, pollution permits in order to stabilize the price to ensure that the price will be staying within a certain price range uh, and this way gives more certainty and it should be clearly communicated to the industries and to the economy more generally uh, in order for them to start the investment to take uncertainty out if you take uncertainty out you will get more investment you get more things done of course, there are three ways to achieve CO2 reductions, and Richard will talk primarily about these three different ways. I will not go into that. Before, as usual, I would like to go for some poll questions. And here are four questions, and I would appreciate if you could answer these uh, questions, as usual, to give us some idea how your thinking is before Richard is talking, and it might change after Richard has talked about it. So the first thing is, is COVID, and the climate policy, is it linked to climate in general? Is it linked to such an extent that climate change makes pandemics more likely? Okay, so that's uh, scientific that climate change is more likely because of pandemics or the other way around, both directions, essentially. Do you think that's the case? Or do you think it's primarily linked through the policy trade-offs uh, characterized? Or do you think we should really treat COVID and climate as two separate things? Okay, that's the first uh, question. The second question is, um, how should climate policy work primarily? Should it work primarily through restricting consumption, uh, including for poor uh, in countries like uh, emerging markets, developing economies, uh, or should it be through innovation and smart growth? And the third question is, should central banks get into climate policy? No. Or should they only go in to the extent it affects the risk management and collateral policy? If they buy up some assets, they should be careful that certain brown assets compared to green assets have more underlying risk and the risk management should take this into account? Or should they go into climate policy altogether? And the fourth question is more a democracy a question. Should climate policy, should it require a clear mandate from the Congress or parliament votes? Or should it, can it be done through the back door uh, since it's so important and shouldn't be undermined some of by also opposition groups like Yellow West and so forth? So I would appreciate if uh, you could answer uh, these questions. Okay, 
so in terms of the first question, it's roughly even. It's one third, one third, one third. So climate change actually makes pandemics more likely. That's 32% think this way. They are mostly connected to policy trade-offs, 36%. And should it be treated separately, it's also one third. So it's a little bit surprising to me at least. Um, climate policy should be primarily worked through restriction on consumption. Only 13%, the Malthusian way is only 13%. 87%, a huge majority I think through smart growth. And should central banks get involved in this? 18% think no. 47% think to the extent it affects risk management and collateral policy. And 34% think they should be involved in general. And the final question is whether you know, climate policy should be done very openly through the front door. 59% think, or almost 60%, but 40% think you can also do it through the back door. You don't have a uh, democracy and uh, you, know, you can overrule some opposition groups. 41% think this way. Think this way. So with this, I let me um, stop here and pass on the floor or the screen to Richard. Uh, we're looking forward to an exciting talk from Richard to give his perspective. Of course, he knows way more about this topic than I do um, because he's worked on it. I think he wrote his first paper in the 70s on this topic, on environmental economics. Great. Thanks very much, Marcus. And that was very interesting. Um, let me just uh, make two remarks at the outset. First, uh, this is work with Joe Aldi, and uh, he knows much more about this than I do. He was Special Assistant to President Obama for Energy and the Environment and served on the Council of Economic Advisors. Um, so if you have any hard questions, he'll be the one to ask them, answer them. Uh, the second point I want to make uh, relates to what Marcus just said. Um, if you read the newspaper uh, in the last two days, uh, you noticed that Joe Biden, who's uh, slightly over 60% to be the next president of the United States, has come out with a $2 trillion plan uh, for dealing with climate change. Um, he doesn't mention discount rate in any of his pronouncements. Um, the amount of money that would be spent here is way beyond anything that uh, Bill Nordhaus uh, mentioned as a possibility for this. Um, and I actually asked him about his discount rate and it goes way up after this November. Um, and then it goes up again uh, four years after January uh, 2021. So I'm going to talk about two groups um, with respect to climate change. One group is climate skeptics. These are ostriches. Um, they say, if I can't see it, it's not happening. Um, and ostrich behavior is, uh, includes, I think, two big themes. One is recent warming is natural climate variation and human behavior is not responsible or not primarily responsible. Um, the other group are concerned environmentalists. Pollyanna is a uh, favorite story from many years ago. And Pollyanna, despite things being extraordinarily uh, dreary, uh, always uh, had hope. And she always said, oh, the future will be great. Everything's going to come out OK. And um, Pollyanna uh, believes are that uh, massive mitigation is politically feasible. Um, and we haven't seen that to date, but we can always change our ways in the future, very Pollyannish. And the second is that mitigation alone will be sufficient to deal with this problem. So we have uh, some central arguments. First to the climate skeptics, um, the natural swings in temperature, te there are such natural swings in temperature, but they tend to be regional and very long uh, term. Uh, you may have heard of the medieval warm period of roughly a thousand years ago. Um, and um, most of the accounts of that period, which uh, we, the ones we have available, uh, were written in Europe and it was very warm in the North Atlantic, but it was cool elsewhere on the planet. Um, and there's overwhelming scientific evidence that dramatically increased greenhouse gases are due to human behavior and is the prime cause of global warming. And we have you know, lots of evidence to that effect if we just look at you know, the gases. I mean, China, for example, has uh, swung into first place. And you know, 50 years ago, it had very little uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions. Um, 
We're going to focus on concerned environmentalists because we think we have many more people falling into that category on this particular talk. And um, we're, I'm going to make uh, two arguments here. Um, these are both to undermine the idea of the Pollyannish efforts, that there's little evidence that the nations of the world are likely are able to cut greenhouse gas emissions, mass, greenhouse gas emissions massively. Um, there's lots of noble talk. Uh, we get the nations of the world get together uh, periodically to make um, uh, bold, voluntary, uh, you know, uh, commitments, uh, but nothing much happens. And then the second point um, is that mitigation alone, even if it's aggressive, uh, will not prevent extreme damages due to uh, climate change. A lot of our climate change is already locked in. Uh, the greenhouse gas is in the atmosphere uh, abate very uh, slowly. Um, moreover, the oceans, which are primary heat sinks, have already warmed, so their ability to uh, absorb more heat is uh, reduced. So we're on track for a very unpleasant uh, future if we only do uh, mitigation alone. Uh, Benjamin you... Franklin, um, I presume all the Americans are familiar with him as the person who comes up with pithy sayings, um, as, as may the foreign guests. Um, but about climate skeptics, he would say, ostrich outlook promotes Pollyanna perspective. So I will, um, I had very nice pictures of the ostrich, Pollyanna, um, and I'm going to get up to Benjamin Franklin. And what I'm arguing is that uh, the ostriches are also Pollyannas. Uh, their view is just go along. Climate change is not a big deal. And that's certainly been uh, the central argument of the Trump administration. And about the concerned environmentalists, I would say a pound of Pollyanna requires ounces of ostrich. And I'm going to try and show some areas where our environmentalists have not really been paying attention. And their usual argument is, if we don't change our way soon, disaster will hit, will hit. But with appropriate political will and moderate sacrifice, we could curb emissions sufficiently to keep damages manageable. Um, and uh, there are, so these environmentalists are ostriches about drawing inferences from the past. The past record is very bleak. Um, and their own predictions from the past have failed. Um, so um, we argue that there are actually need to be three prongs for a prudent climate policy. One, mitigation, and it's a very important effort. Uh, neither of the other two efforts alone could do, would be appropriate. Uh, adaptation, uh, which means things like um, you know, building seawalls, restoring marshes, um, even moving uh, human activity away from the coasts uh, will be necessary. And finally, amelioration, which is given any level of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, uh, reducing their consequences. And I would quote uh, President Kennedy here uh, to state the facts frankly, is not to despair the future nor indict the past, it's just to face facts. So um, with mitigation, by the way, uh, the effort, I mean, we have to get down to zero emissions. Uh, but ultimately, towards the end of the century, we will actually have to be pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere. Uh, one of the favorite ways to do this is to plant a lot of trees. But it has to be a lot, a lot, a lot of trees. Um, Adaptation, I just mentioned, that would uh, include these three uh, measures. And finally, amelioration, which is taking measures that reduce the climate change given specific levels of atmospheric concentrations. Uh, the most prominent example is sodium, solar radiation uh, management. It's called geoengineering. I'm sure some of you are uh, shaking your computer screens in anger, uh, but we'll have to deal with that. Um, most concerned environmentalists are one-pronged players. That is, they focus on mitigation. That certainly was uh, the Joe Biden approach that was announced in the last couple of days. Uh, we will identify one, two, and three-pronged players. We, these are the three prongs that we think about, and we think that we need all three prongs. So 
This is the idea that we've heard from environmentalists. Al Gore is probably the most prominent in the United States. Um, and the next 10 years are the last chance. So in 2006, uh, uh, Gore said, unless drastic measures are taken to reduce greenhouse gases within the next 10 years, the world will reach a point of no return. So that would have been in 2016. And then in 2018, he said, time is running out, so we must capitalize and build upon solutions that are available today. So this is sort of the Cassandra uh, Pollyanna approach to policy. Tell everybody that things are terrible, uh, that we only have a few years left. Uh, when those few years go by, uh, say, well, no, there's a future. Uh, there is a future possibility. Jim Hansen, a, a great no, a scientist who told us a lot about climate change, told us in 2006, we have at most 10 years, not 10 years to decide upon action, but 10 years to fundamentally alter the trajectory of global greenhouse emissions. We did not do that. And in 2019, he said, Earth is not lost today, but time for action is short. We're calling for time for action, but we're saying that what you're proposing to do um, will not be sufficient. And then I know there are some Europeans on this uh, talk. Um, in 2008, um, Stavros Dimas, who was the Director General for the Environment, said, this is the last two, this agreement, the last chance to bring climate uh, under control before it is too late. And in 2019, I'm sure you many of you recognize Greta Thunberg. Um, Jean-Claude Juncker, uh, who's the EC president, said, <clears throat> this is our goal to ensure that one fourth of the budget goes towards climate change mitigation, and this is going to be a paradigm shift. So our basic argument is emission mitigation has served as the principal instrument of climate policy since 1990. The last clear chance has already been passed. This, that's the, that, that's the unhappy fact. CO2 emissions <coughs> have climbed rapidly for 60 years. Concentrations have climbed rapidly for 60 years. And global temperatures have increased <coughs> for 130 years. So here are the CO2 emissions in gigatons. And you can see it's a steady upward trajectory. And we get little breaks around a variety of conferences. Um, but still, we've gone from 8 to 38 um, and with no clear change in trajectory uh, in sight. Atmospheric concentrations have grown steadily upward at a slightly accelerating uh, path uh, in terms of uh, parts per million or parts per whatever you want to do. And uh, global climate change has, uh, you know, gone up uh, ever since 1890. Here's the fitted curve. And you can see that things are getting worse in terms of temperature on a uh, steady basis. So um, the Paris Agreement uh, said that we need to be well below to two degrees, and they set 1.5 degrees as a, um, uh, a desirable goal. Um, if you, uh, uh, the environmental scientists have told us, however, that the country's pledges are inconsistent with the goals. By the way, countries, very few countries are uh, meeting their pledges, and those pledges are only voluntary. Um, since 2000, um, you know, they, they increased in 2018. 85% um, of the increase was from the United States and China, both countries, by the way, which you would think would, um, you know, were uh, the two most powerful countries in the world, um, probably could most afford to do something about it. And uh, Climate Action Tracker, which is a, a nonprofit that deals with this, said that most countries are nowhere near the radical steps that are required. Um, which is in order to keep the goal of 1.5 degrees centigrade alive, we'd have to have uh, global emissions by 2030. So here's a, a graph that shows what we're going to have to do. This is to have a one, you know, uh, Bruce, Marcus uh, told us about risk. This is to have a one half chance of having a two degree warming by 2100. So you can see up until the present time is that light blue line. 
And if we had no new uh, climate policy or emissions, we would get this reddish line. What we have to do is the gray line. And you'll notice that around uh, you know, 2070, um, emissions have fallen to zero. And we're actually getting into the negative emissions range. So that's to have a, only a one half chance of holding things down below two degrees. So uh, if we look at history, um, in the last uh, 10 years, we've had a decarbonization rate. That's the amount of carbon uh, we're putting into the atmosphere per, um, you know, ton of, per uh, billion dollars of economic activity or any other measure of economic activity. And it's gone down by about 0.7% per year. If we have no new policies, in 2050, we'll be, 2052 will be at two degrees warming. If we have the Paris Agreement plus uh, continued am, uh, ambition, uh, meaning decarbonization rate of 2% a year, that would be 2061. And if we go to 5% a year, which is something we've never come close to approaching, it will go to 2067. So, Richard, so do, you the future, some, do you have some confidence intervals on this too? Because these are wild estimates, I guess. Uh, there must be a lot of uncertainty about, around these estimates. Or is it? Yes, I'm, no, I'm sure there is a lot of uncertainty around the estimates. And that would make me more unhappy rather than less mm -hmm. unhappy. Yes. Um, so um, anyhow, these are some of the things that happened. Uh, Mark asked us at the outset as to whether um, Climate change and uh, pandemics are correlated. You can see in the lower left-hand picture, that's a very elegant mosquito. Um, most scientists think that there'll be a significant correlation between uh, disease and uh, global climate change. Um, many of the pandemics arise in uh, very hot climates. Uh, I should just go over roughly what these things are. On the upper left-hand side is a coral reef that's dying due to warmer temperatures. Um, the second picture is the campfire um, in Paradise, California. The third picture is Miami during the 2019 king tide. Um, then we have the mosquito. Uh, we have farming in a parched landscape. And um, the uh, last picture is the picture of uh, Typhoon Hajibis, which uh, hit, uh, you know, Japan this year, uh, the five, level five super typhoon. So we'll get all sorts of different things. Uh, the likelihood of a climate catastrophe uh, continuing on our present course with ambition is quite likely. So these are the resources um, that are uh, required in billions of U.S. dollars. Uh, by the way, this is conveniently, we've made this up before, but this is, uh, $2 uh, trillion. Adaptation is uh, re relatively inexpensive. That's about you know, $300 billion. And geoengineering, it's not that we neglected it, but the amount of money that um, we're spending on geoengineering is now um, you know, uh, trivial so that virtually doesn't show up. Um, this is in 2030. Um, so you need exacting vision to see the cost that we would need for geoengineering. Um, if it's solar radiation management, such as we're talking about, this is launching planes into the stratosphere. Uh, they would be dumping some sub substance like sulfur dioxide uh, to uh, block part of the sun. So um, I have a fable which um, I will uh, go through extremely quickly to introduce the three prongs of policy. I'm going to talk about the moral hazard concern. That's the major reason why um, most environmental scientists don't like discussing geoengineering. Um, and it's also why they've given a relatively short shrift to adaptation. Then we'll talk about one, two, and three prong players. Then I'll talk about the infeasibility of the feasibility argument for the 1.5 and two degree targets. And then I'll come back to a dynamic three prong strategy for climate policy. So basically, we think of this as <clears throat> what's happened to the world. This was a quiet village. They had a few small sheep. They had uh, a lot of crops. And then, uh, as happened with uh, the Industrial Revolution and period thereafter, um, they developed hybrid sheep. Hybrid sheep were much more productive. Um, 
The one danger of hybrid sheep is they attract the wolves. And they stopped having agriculture and they moved into this more productive industry. So the boy cried out, fewer hybrid sheep, more crops. But they didn't do that. So they said, well, what we should do, um, and the wolves, by the way, came into the atmosphere or came into the environs. Uh, the boy said, put up protective fences. And they did some of that, but not enough. You see there are gaps in these protective fences. <clears throat> so he then said, what we need to do is have the equivalent of what we call um, amelioration. We need to have a posse uh, to drive out the wolves. So he said, raise the posse. And the villagers said, we have no experience with that. As riders or with guns, it's very dangerous. They hadn't read uh, Kenneth Arrow's uh, famous article on the economic implications of learning by doing. And they said, no top posse. So the equilibrium is they had too many sheep, too many hybrid sheep, too many wolves, not enough fences, and no posse, so it's desirable. So they're falling short of mitigation, adaptation, and amelioration. And that's where we think we are today. So let's talk about the moral hazard concerns. Now, these three techniques are substitutes for one another. If we had marshes all along our coasts, we wouldn't have to worry you know, of sufficient size, we wouldn't have to worry about coastal flooding. Um, but investing in one of these reduces the value of another. So that explains the modest discussion of adaptation among environmentalists <clears throat> and the extreme hostility to amelioration geoengineering uh, among this group. Um, some, might, some citizens might mistakenly think that geoengineering is a cure. Now, I should remark, we know that geoengineering works, um, or at least total irradiation management as a form of geoengineering works, because after uh, volcanoes have exploded, um, we've seen, we've recorded in the past that the Earth gets cooler for a period of time. And that's basically what solar radiation management uh, should be thought to do. Um, Richard, can I ask a question about the geoengineering? Sure. Um, so one uh, question is how much, what's the risk of side effects? So how risky is the geoengineering compared to the other measures? Did you well, take the risk of side effects is non-trivial, um, but it's like the risk of side effects for almost any medical treatment. The mm -hmm. question is if we can keep the temperature um, at two degrees centigrade uh, rather than three degrees centigrade, are we willing to risk the side effects? And solar radiation management does not deal with all of the problems that climate change creates. And it will do things like there's worried about the acidification of the oceans. Um, but you, um, we all understand what loss aversion is. And um, there's the devil that you don't know that people give a lot more attention to than the devil that you do know. Um, but I don't want the world to, um, be on the trajectory that it currently is. And so, so I think that's what you would say, it's a cost benefit analysis. And I think the costs here in terms of side effects uh, will probably prove to be uh, quite minor relative to the benefits that are achieved. But we're uh, suggesting at the end that we have this uh, learning process uh, starting now with um, you know, significant scientific uh, efforts to figure out what's going on uh, some modest experiments to see what happens when we uh, distribute things in the atmosphere, um, and some early discussions of how we are going to be building planes. It takes something like seven to 10 years to figure out how to, uh, or to design a plane that would be able to do this. Uh, the cost of this would be, you know, in the tens or maybe hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, but it's trivial relative to what we would lose from climate change. Um, and by the way, this might be a go, no go. We might decide to uh, pursue this course and then side, side effects are just too great. Yeah. So um, the way we think of the benefits of everything, and this is follows on Marcus's thing, is the damages avoided plus <coughs> the cost of instruments. And we think that all of these uncertainties should be assessed using von Neumann-Morgenstern utilities. 
Marcus would probably ask me, how am I ever going to get these subjective probabilities? And I, I would say, oh, I have very smart friends. No, I think that that's a, you know, a hard problem. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to select the mix of instruments to maximize expected benefits and support your favorite instruments and constrain the other instruments. Now, our actual approach to substitute instruments has been support and significantly constrain these other instruments. So push for mitigation, gently acknowledge adaptation. There have been a few people who have pushed for this. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg uh, did this in New York City, but we still haven't covered our subways, which would be, you know, uh, you know, having basically storm dorms for subways, which would be incredibly cheap to do. Um, I'm right now in Florida on the coast and uh, people are building houses up and down this coast, uh, which are sure to get flooded at some day. And shun uh, solar geoengineering. Um, you mentioned that uh, Larry Summers had spoken with this group. Um, a dozen years ago, he and I, and um, an expert on geoengineering named David Keith, who's also at our school, um, showed up at a conference at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and mentioned the word geoengineering. And you would have thought that uh, we were proposing to, you know, uh, annihilate children or something to that effect, the way people responded to us. Right now, we're spending less than $10 million a year on geoengineering uh, uh, research. Um, so if you have something that you know that works but may have significant side effects, uh, you shouldn't just say, well, we won't even bother to look into it. So this finger on the scale approach to risk analysis is locking in extreme expected da damages. So um, I, um, this is the old moral hazard concern. Don't pursue geoengineering. It would reduce emission control efforts. Um, we actually think that there's some chance that um, there will be what we call an awful action alert. <clears throat> that if you're considering something like solar geoengineering, that could actually make people think that um, climate change is a more consequential problem. Uh, right now, we think that the extreme danger of the situation <clears throat> is not widely recognized, or at least not widely recognized among the average citizen who's probably the age of the average person on this call. Um, and pursuing an awful action extre indicates extreme danger and then the public might become more supportive of other instruments. Now, you may think that this is a fanciful argument, um, <clears throat> but I'm gonna relate this to uh, geoengineering and emissions reduction, but also to the COVID situation. So on uh, March 12th of this year, President Trump announced a travel ban for travelers from Europe, which is something that nobody thought would happen. And uh, the uh, S&P closed down uh, nine and a half percent. One of the massive drops in the stock market this year. So he announced something which people thought would actually make the COVID epidemic less serious, but it so scared people that the stock market dropped nine and a half percent. And then on March 16th, the Federal Reserve cut interest rates by hundred basis points and they announced $700 billion in lending facilities. Once again, a thing to make the COVID crisis uh, less serious. Uh, in this case, um, from a financial standpoint, <clears throat> and the stock market dropped 12%. And these were both um, used to uh, attribute uh, the causes of these uh, massive declines. I mean, today, when there's a massive decline, it will be 2%. You know, down 9% and down 12% uh, are really remarkable types of things. So, so Richard, um, do you think that the public is not fully recognizing the dangers out there? So it needs a signaling effect, even though there are all these demonstrations across the globe, especially in Europe and Greta Thunberg. I think it, it needs a signaling from the government. Right, this is, a, this is a signal. And uh, people may recognize things in Europe. When things happen in Europe, by the way, um, unless you're a professor from Germany, they don't register in the United States. Uh, many years ago, when there was the great heat wave in Paris, which killed, um, you know, uh, you know, many hundreds of uh, elderly people, uh, that was the, you know, one of the coolest summers uh, in recent past in the United States. And basically, we didn't know that it was happening. Um, 
the California fires, uh, you know, they made our news, but in New England, we don't have forest fires because things are too damp. So that didn't register much in New England. Um, so anyhow, so this if, is what I'm talking so about. If, if, just a legal background, if, if somebody like, you know, Elon Musk or somebody were to do and start experimenting with geoengineering, is it easy to do or it's very hard to get approval to do so? Well, we, our colleague David Keith is actually doing an experiment involving a very, you know, sending up one balloon Mm -hmm. uh, to reduce stuff into the atmosphere. Um, I don't know what he did to get um, approval, but Elon Musk does things on a grand scale. You know, I think if he sent up one balloon, there wouldn't be much problem. Um, I think if he wanted to do something uh, dramatically more, there would be a problem. Of course, there's nothing that we could, nothing that anybody could do except uh, say shame <clears throat> if some country like Bulgaria said, you know, we're, we're going to become the center of geoengineering. We're going to do some experiments. Mm -hmm. And geoengineering, uh, both the knowledge and the actual cooling of the earth is a, a public good, or if you feel that way, a public bad. Otherwise, it would spread from Bulgaria around the earth if it were done in a massive way. Um, and you don't think rich universities like um, Harvard could not do it on their own? So there is government money needed? I think uh, they could. I, I think that Harvard could do it on its own, but it would have to, um, you know, deal with, there would then be regular, you know, if it was done on a massive basis, there'd probably be some uh, regulatory, uh, you know, concerns and Congress would limit it in some way, at least at the immediate moment. So Glenn opinion. Rudebusch would like to know, you know, which international organization would regulate that? So if, who would decide well, that we do a big scale geoengineering? Had a lot of, we've had a lot of discussions, not a lot, at our university specifically on the international governance of uh, geoengineering and geoengineering research. Um, my view is we can do an awful lot of research without having international agreements. International agreements are not easy to come by. Um, and my expectation is that in the uh, relatively short run, countries will be doing this on their own, uh, particularly some hot countries. So you could imagine that, you know, India or Brazil, um, or for that matter, China would be among the first countries to do this. I suspect the United States, uh, which has sort of more hostility to these types of things, will not be at the forefront, nor will Germany. That, but that's, you know, second order speculation. You will come to the timing issue, the dynamic problems in a minute, no? I, otherwise I would ask you about. Is it important that we started early from a climate perspective besides the experimentation that we learn how to do it? So yeah, we have we to learn it? how, one, we have to learn how to do it. We have to learn what the side effects are. Um, it's not clear, for example, um, <clears throat> what substance should be used uh, for this purpose. Um, if, you know, this is the way we did geoengineering. There are also other proposed modes of geoengineering, um, such as uh, distributing iron filings on the ocean uh, to help uh, build algae. Um, there have been proposals for putting strips of aluminum foil in space to reflect back some of the <coughs> sun's uh, sunlight. Um, I think that the side effects of uh, figuring out how to build the planes are essentially zero. And that would probably have some spillovers to other types of things that we might want to do with planes. Um, so, you know, different things would have different consequences. But it's certainly an area where we should have some, you know, significant discussion. Um, and, you know, this is what you just discussed. Um, if we decide that we want to do this, let's assume which isn't so unlikely, that there was massive flooding of Miami. <clears throat> so basically the city became in, uh, uninhabitable due to some massive tropical storm. We would then decide that we wanted to do something in a uh, real hurry, um, but we wouldn't be equipped to do so um, because it takes you know years to figure out how to do it. So we should at least think somewhat about what a critical path uh, would be. So this is an extreme danger that's not currently confronted. So let me just mention 
the zero, one, and two, and three prong players. Um, a denier of human caused climate change is a zero prong player. They want to do nothing. Uh, a climate control assure is <coughs> the one prong policy strategy, which is emission mitigation. And the climate policy realist, and of course, we put ourselves in that category, thinks that we should have a three prong strategy with mitigation, adaptation, and geoengineering. So uh, Donald Trump is a zero prong player. Uh, Al Gore is a one-pronged player. Uh, uh, Barack Obama, who did discuss uh, adaptation uh, to some extent uh, later in his term, is a two-pronged player. And Andrew Yang, um, who <coughs> was a presidential candidate this time, though he didn't uh, do very well. And Bill Gates are three-pronged players. By the way, Bill Gates is one of the people who is uh, supporting the current experiment that's uh, going on with geoengineering. So if you want to know the link between COVID and, um, you know, uh, climate change uh, for sensible policy, Bill Gates is, is the one good link that I know. He's doing a lot to support vaccine research in some of the most innovative ways, including he's very heavily involved in the Oxford vaccine, which is the one that's in the forefront. And he has a very far-sighted view towards thinking about solar uh, geoengineering. Um, <clears throat> so I talked about the infeasibility of these targets. Today's capital stock, if we use them through the end of its economic lifetime, will surely result in getting well above 1.5 degrees centigrade. Um, uh, we're gonna have to have negative greenhouse gas emissions over the in net over the 2050 to 2100 period, probably starting around, um, 2070. Um, so we're going to have to electrify, you know, basically our economy, and we're going to have to be generating electricity for biomass. Plus, we're going to have to have carbon capture and storage. Uh, wind and solar power alone would not be sufficient. And we may have to even have direct air capture. So that's much more expensive. Okay, the political economy of 1.5 and 2 degree targets. Last 30 years, illustrate strong, we, we don't like the term free riding, we like the term cheap riding, which means that people will do something even though uh, they don't get quite enough benefit from it um, to make it worth a while, but they'll do it on a moderate basis. And that's basically what we've seen. Um, and um, their domestic energy and climate policies reveal strong opposition to raising energy prices. Um, 90% of the economists that I know think that, uh, as Marcus mentioned, that carbon taxes or some sort of, uh, you know, emission permits make sense. Um, we certainly haven't seen them, and I would be surprised that, you know, we're going to get there that soon, though we would like it. And what we basically... Do you think, Richard, that the current fiscal situation might actually make it easier to impose carbon taxes because we have a, a budget deficit which going is not sustainable down the road? It probably would, but one of the problems, uh, I mean, uh, if you look at, uh, I don't think this has happened in the United States, but if you look at governments around the world, the easiest way to get overthrown is to raise the prices of energy. Um, and that's the reason why we have continuing fossil one of the reasons why we have continuing fossil fuel subsidies in uh, many countries. I mean, Venezuela, for example, has uh, gasoline at a very low price, um, despite the fact that uh, there are uh, very short supplies uh, because Mr. Maduro wants to stay in power. Um, and if you had carbon pricing in the United States, you would find that people would say, oh, well, Poor people or middle class people will uh, will be suffering, so we don't want to have uh, that. Um, Even if you we'll swap there, it for labor taxes, let's say you reduce right. labor. Even if you reduce labor taxes, well, I think that people will or... tend to look at say, I don't, I I like A, but I don't like B. Um, huh. But um, I I would be perfectly happy to uh, reduce uh, labor taxes and increase carbon taxes. Um, but uh, uh, I don't see that as happening soon. I don't believe that that was part of the proposals for 
you know, any of the uh, major candidates. So this is uh, what we basically recommend. All these things sort of uh, feedback onto each other. Um, our major point um, is that we should start now. Um, I was pleased to see that in your survey, Marcus, that there was mm -hmm. a uh, strong support for technological innovation and economic growth as a way of dealing with these uh, particular problems. By the way, we're perfectly happy to have uh, the Bentheim Center send out our slides. And if you're uh, interested uh, in them, oh, this is what we consider to be the act, learn, act approach to three-pronged climate policy. Time is a critical ingredient. Um, and here are two papers which discuss basically what uh, we discussed today. And the resources for the future discussion paper um, is easily available online. So um, thank you for your attention. And if you have, uh, if there's any time and you have any tough questions, uh, my colleague Joe Aldi will answer them. Thanks a lot, uh, Richard and, uh, and Joe. So we have a, a bunch of questions and I would like to throw them at you. So uh, Mike Dotsi would like to know if you compare a nuclear power, how does nuclear power fit in? Uh, would you say we have to replace a lot of our energy production with nuclear power that's less risky than uh, uh, geoengineering? Uh, where do you see the trade-offs uh, between nuclear and geoengineering? Mm -hmm. Richard, you want me to jump in and take the questions? Then? Yeah, I want you to take all the questions. Okay, that'd be great. So, so on nuclear, yeah, as Richard noted, we think it's really important to push on emission mitigation as well as on these other margins on adaptation as well as amelioration. Nuclear power can certainly be uh, part of the equation, uh, but you're not going to say let's just build out a lot of nuclear and then we don't have to worry about adaptation or amelioration. We just don't see, given the track record over the last 30 years, that enough has been done. Uh, to reduce our emissions and to build out enough low cost ways of generating zero carbon energy uh, for us to continue down the one prong mitigation route. So, so nuclear is part of the equation, uh, but it doesn't rule out the need, uh, we think, for adaptation in solar geoengineering. So the next bunch of questions, I would like to go to uh, some democracy aspects where we talked about the signaling effect or scaring uh, people essentially. Um, do you think that the, you know, the innovation in geoengineering will come more from democratic countries or will it come more from you know, authoritarian run countries? So who will make the innovation uh, there? And how important is that you take the people with you in this because they're very scared and fear is a big component uh, on this. How would you calm it down and uh, come up with you know, some calming features? How do you see the whole thing carrying the people with you? Uh, on this endeavor? One thing I would stress on the innovation part is solar geoengineering, we probably don't need a lot of, of innovation per se. Uh, we, we know what kind of particles will actually work in reflecting the incoming sunlight. Uh, we, uh, we just need to find ways of actually, you know, flying airplanes probably 50, 60,000 feet in the air and design them in a way to uh, inject those aerosols into the atmosphere. We can already fly planes that high, just the planes we build that go that high typically just have a pilot or two and cameras, uh, as opposed to having uh, a payload that and have a design so that it can fly at that altitude and inject the aerosols into the air. So when we've talked to some of the people who are experts on this and, and the communications they've had with people in the aviation industry on actually building delivery vehicles like this, it's not a very difficult engineering problem. It's something one that if you had made a crash course, you could have a fleet of these uh, uh, airplanes uh, operating probably within a decade or so. Uh, so, so I'm not sure it's necessarily a, a, a tough innovation question. I think the question gets to be more of how do we think about how we might govern this kind of technology and some of the concerns about who's going to be uh, uh, managing uh, the technology and determining the extent to which it gets used. Um, and I think there are some important questions though about how we think that this can help galvanize uh, attention and focus and make salient for the public that need to take more action on this with respect to climate change. There have been a couple of, of little uh, uh, survey uh, efforts that have been done to get a sense of how people might respond in at least a survey context, an online survey context, to the prospect of uh, solar uh, geoengineering. And it suggests there may not be an offsetting effect on mitigation. There's one study that conducted uh, in a community in northern Germany even suggests there might be interest in doing more on emission mitigation through personal behavior, 
in response to this because they recognize how this is actually much more scary if governments recognize that in order to manage these risks and to protect their publics, they're going to have to go that next step and inject aerosols into the upper stratosphere and basically communicate to the public, we have to start behaving as if we're volcanoes in order to somehow manage some of the risk associated with the changing climate. So about the timing, I would like to come back on the timing. What's your main argument that you say, okay, let's not do anything on geoengineering for now. Let's just keep the pressure on on mitigation. And if we were to, we can always quickly do the geoengineering. So if it is not so complicated, we have to experiment for five years or something, but then we've put the pressure on and we go on mitigation. And once, you know, we can't handle it on the mitigation side, we can still switch on our, our geoengineering switch very quickly because it's a fairly easy technology compared to the other technologies. What's your argument uh, against that? That argument may have made a lot of sense in the 1990s. That, that back then, if we'd actually gotten our act together globally and been able to manage our emissions of greenhouse gases, uh, then we could have thought, well, we've got this as a kind of backstop in the event we don't do enough. Uh, but I think as Richard noted, we've had this kind of repeated false assurances uh, that we can dramatically reduce our emissions quickly, that we can reach these goals. As, as we note in our paper, the first time that there was uh, any international institution calling for limiting warming to two degrees C, uh, it was in the year 1990. We've been talking about two degrees C for a long time, uh, and we're near the point now where if we just use our, the capital stock that exists, not talking about power plants that burn coal that we may build next year or new cars that come online next year, we're talking about what already exists now, that we're actually really pushing up against two degrees C with the existing capital stock. So I think that the recognition is that we need to be undertaking some actions now to really understand uh, solar geoengineering. I, I think to the, the concerns that people have about the potential unintended consequences, this is why we need to take time now to start ramping up geoengineering to both understand the engineering of its deployment, but also think about what might be some of the complementary scientific research we wanna undertake to really understand what might be the full range of consequences of a solar geoengineering intervention. Um, that if you're not doing that research now, and we find that actually we get to two degrees C faster than we thought, we actually get our sort of a, you know, the, the wrong draw to this distribution given the uncertainties, once they get resolved, some we end up finding we're getting to two degrees C even faster than we thought, then that may be pushing us up against sort of too late to get a thoughtful, well-planned, well-executed geoengineering intervention. So I think Given the uncertainties, we need to be making those investments now. We need to be thinking about how we invest in the governance now, uh, just as we need to be making the same kinds of investments and thoughts on adaptation. Now, we may say we can move this stuff quickly if everything, if all the policy is well designed and executed, but if there's anything we've learned on the mitigation side is that we don't always implement the globally uh, cost-effective uh, or efficient uh, policy on mitigation, that the political economy uh, and the nature of our governance tends to slow things down. And so that's why we think it makes sense now to push as we need to on all three of these margins today. But do you think it should sure be done primarily by, the problem. by the governments or by universities or by private firms? So if you, you know, were to outsource it, um, who should the, the experimental phase? I don't think there might be so much resistance to just experiment at a small scale to learn and then be ready if we need it later on. Uh, do you think who should do the experiments? Should it be done primarily by governments or the NSF? Or have you thought about this? Or can it even be private firms? If you look at va vaccines, it's similar. It's a lot of innovation is done on, on the private side as well. Can I respond and to also to your previous question, yes. Marcus? Um, and this relates to the COVID situation. If you look what happened with vaccine development now, it was remarkable the number of protective elements that the world demanded as we developed vaccines. And we ruled out challenge trials, which could have uh, uh, speeded up this process um, enormously. We could have saved hundreds of thousands of lives if we had developed a vaccine four months earlier than it came along. But we weren't willing to do that until we had tested this and tested that. Um, we could have gone at various places straight to uh, massive trials but we aren't willing to do that. And probably with geoengineering, we're gonna to have to start by putting up, you know, three units and seeing what happens and then putting up eight units and seeing what happens and then putting up 20 units and seeing what happens. And I hope that we will do the same thing that we did with vaccines, which was 
have all sorts of efforts around the world done by private organizations, frequently with government assistance. Um, the uh, leading uh, candidates right now are things like uh, the Oxford trial, um, supported by philanthropists, government, um, and, you know, Oxford University. Um, you know, Elon Musk seems to be pretty uh, clever. I'd like to see him be one of the competitors. But the great thing about the vaccines is we have 100 competitors. Um, mm -hmm. And here we don't need 100 competitors, but, you know, more than two is desirable. By the way, I'd let Princeton do this. You have very good art, environmental engineering yes. uh, department. We have some of our colleagues are participating to this uh, talk. So Jim Stock actually would like to know, he would like to know uh, why most oil companies are favoring uh, geoengineering. Uh, does it make you concerned that they essentially just, you know, we can continue using our oil because we know another way to fix it. And that might be why the environmentalists are not so big a fan of it, just to give an excuse to keep on using uh, oil. What's your response? I, I'll admit that I, I'm, I, I found it interesting that the oil and gas companies, uh, and especially the coal companies, who among the fossil fuels will be the first ones to lose out with emission mitigation, haven't been more vocal about this approach. Um, I, I think that, that you know, it, it, it's interesting to think about like a company like BP, which has recently put forward, I think Shell has as well, fairly aggressive goals for how they're going to reduce their carbon intensity. And they've talked a lot about what effectively is going to be their role on the emission mitigation uh, margin. Um, I, I will say this, the environmental community generally is not a fan of this. Uh, the Climate Action Network, uh, the International Climate Act Action Network, which is a group of about 1,200 environmental uh, organizations around the world that works on climate change policy, they came out with a statement last fall opposing even research on solar geoengineering, noting that there's three U.S.-based environmental groups that said they believed in small-scale experiments, but no large-scale experiments. But the environmental community is, is uh, I think, still fully opposed uh, to the idea of doing solar geoengineering. Uh, but it, it's one of these things where, as, as Richard noted, given the track record, uh, we don't have a lot of hope for emission mitigation getting us down um, to what's really necessary. And, and the thing, too, is to, to recognize the extent to which we've seen emission reductions occur in places like the United States or in Europe. A lot of that has been the relatively low-hanging fruit of reducing the carbon intensity in the power sector being able to use what has become fairly inexpensive wind and solar technology to back out coal power. It's gonna get a lot harder when we have to back out emissions in transportation and displace liquid fuels and to displace a lot of the emissions that occur in the industrial sectors. Those are gonna be a lot more expensive and a lot harder, I think, politically to make happen. Thanks. So let me switch gears a little bit and, and get an idea of what we talked about earlier that some smaller countries might start the experiments and actually might also run some schemes how does this change the international bargaining power in international organizations? So everybody would like to know how does, you know, interaction with trading, trade wars between China and the US, but it could be that a bunch of small countries say, okay, we do a big geoengineering exercise and this might change, you know, the next Paris meeting dramatically. Uh, do you see any dynamics coming from that, that suddenly you get people, the world gets its act together because they're scared of geoengineering? Is this, a way to push the world to get things done? Well, I, I think there, there's going to be a question soon, I think, for some of the developing countries who are likely to be um, the first to really suffer adverse catastrophic consequences from a warming climate uh, that lack the resources, I think, to adapt, that lack the technological capacity to adapt well uh, to, to climate change. Uh, and then the issue is, do they continue to do what they've been doing typically over uh, the negotiations over the last several decades, which is to push all the more on developed countries to reduce their emissions and to provide financial aid to assist those developing countries? Or do you see the conversation change and you get in the UN climate talks for the first time a serious discussion about solar geoengineering? And, and I think that's, that's the real question is whether or not uh, you, you get them to sort of push harder on emission mitigation, which has just not been that effective in the international talks, or do you actually change the nature of the conversation that you have this, this as we describe it, awful action alert uh, that gets them to recognize we all need to take more action to be more serious about this uh, in, in the event that we recognize the need to go forward with solar geoengineering. So in this international context, I mean, of course, a lot of this talked about uh, border adjustment taxes for CO2 
Uh, do you see an interaction on, on geoengineering? I mean, you can see that, again, I come back to the, the bargaining power uh, across the different nations, but it could be in the mix of geoengineering, border adjustment tax, and, uh, and other components as well. Um, so I would like to conclude our presentation here, or your presentation, and thanks a lot. We typically concluded with a positive note. So of course, you might have a very positive take that geoengineering is actually saving the world and is saving the climate. Uh, but do you have a, a positive outlook, which ideally takes the unease away for many people who have some uneasiness with geoengineering and I understand that you see this the only way to solve the issue because otherwise there's no way to deal with it uh, in the, this given, given the scale of the problem we are having. having. So any positive final note uh, for both of you? Well, my positive note would be, um, as I mentioned that a dozen years ago, you couldn't discuss this subject in polite company. <clears throat> and now when we bring this up with, um, you know, scientists, um, environmentalists, um, economists, uh, there's a much more receptive feeling. I think it's uh, important. The Environmental Defense Fund, a uh, very well-respected environmental organization is now uh, discussing this seriously. Uh, Harvard and MIT um, are proposing a significant joint research venture um, on this uh, subject that I mean in the, uh, you know, many, many millions of uh, dollars. Um, there are just, you know, the scientific community seems to be more receptive. Our, the head of our university center for the environment, um, who used to teach at Princeton until he got smarter, um, Dan Schrag, um, you know, is very interested in this approach to life. So I think the discussion is going forward. Um, so, and I, I think without open discussion, uh, we have no chance. I also think that people are recognizing the dangers that we're in. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm hoping that some people in the progressive movement might actually sort of say, if we're really worried about uh, saving the planet, here's another way that we can save the planet. And I don't expect that to happen, you know, through this election cycle, but I expect it to happen you know, in a year or two. Not all of them, but some prominent person. Okay, that's quite a statement in a year or two. Joe, do you want to add another? I just said some comment? prominent person. I didn't say <laughs> most prominent people. Fair enough. <laughs> I'll conclude by, by, by noting that I think that the thing that gives me hope is seeing how, uh, as we're identifying more margins by which we can manage climate change risk, uh, we're getting more and more serious people who are doing the, the research and the analysis to better understand how to design those interventions, to think about the science and engineering, and how we can marry that then with subsequently with the policy and creating the right incentives for moving on all those. I, I know there were a few questions about direct air capture of CO2. That's another margin we think that makes a lot of sense uh, that one can pursue to try to actually pull more CO2 out of the atmosphere. Uh, but I think it's, it's the, the nature of the problem is being better understood, and, and that's creating the incentive to draw the best and brightest minds to try to, try to address the problem. And, and I know that, that even the next generation, like my eight-year-old Cooper here, uh, are getting more and more focused on climate change, uh, and they're inspiring us to do more. And we know that they're, they're going to be ready when we're past the baton for thinking through what's the best, most important, and effective ways for managing uh, climate change in the future. Thanks for having us, Mark. Thank, thanks a lot. Thank Let me just inject to one last question for Richard, that the trust in science, you, Joe mentioned a lot, you know, we have all these smart people and scientists coming up with various schemes, but if we don't have, the, the, the scientists don't have the trust of the population to go along, that's probably the biggest challenge uh, to ensure that. And we see, you know, also with the COVID crisis, there's a lot of skepticism towards science as well. And that's, a big challenge. I don't know whether you have a final thought, 20 seconds answer for that. Um, well, how to ensure um, that. Um, yes. I've been looking at sine waves uh, since I was, uh, I guess, 11 years old. Mm -hmm. And um, I see a positive second derivative. Yeah. And I think that we're pretty close to the uh, trough 
on that. Okay. So um, I'm hopeful. I'm I'm a, it's, uh, always an optimist, and I think that things are uh, turning up for uh, the better. Um, I think that even in the United States, in the Republican Party, there are many people who are starting to say we have to take science um, more seriously. Um, not uh, President Trump's most ardent supporters, uh, but there's uh, beginning to be progress in that direction. So I'm, I'm hopeful. So with this positive note, uh, let's conclude. And uh, thanks a lot. And thanks to all participants for hanging out 25 minutes longer than we planned, but uh, it was exciting insights. And uh, thanks to both of you, Richard and Joe, and hope to see you in the real world soon and okay. hope to for the participants to see you next week for another seminar webinar series thank Bye -bye. you Bye -bye. thank you